Hello, and welcome to Que Pasa. I'm Michael Lewis, the host of the show, and this week we'll be visiting the Western New Mexico Aviation Heritage Museum. This is a great museum here that we have in our town, and it's relatively new. The Historical Society here renovated this building in the last few years, and they've come up with a really great little museum. I would encourage all locals to go out and visit this museum. Also, when you have friends and family in town, take them to this museum because it has a lot of neat information about the early years of aviation through New Mexico. Steve Owen, who is a volunteer at the museum, will be giving us a tour today. So let's join Steve for a tour of the museum. Our museum here deals basically with two time frames and addresses the history of uh, airways navigation across this corridor. We have here a major transcontinental corridor, not only for aviation, but Route 66 and also the Santa Fe Railroad. Mm -hmm. So there's a great deal of history along this area. And what we're focused on with the museum, of course, is the Mid-Continental Airway that was created in 1929, basically. It started out with uh, Charles Lindbergh becoming technical advisor for transcontinental air transport and uh, Lindbergh had just flown the Atlantic, he was a national hero, and uh, they were quite uh, fortunate to bring him on board to help create this airline. And their goal was coast-to-coast -coast service, coast-to-coast -coast, uh, travel, New York to Los Angeles in 48 hours. On the train it was three and a half to four days, which wasn't acceptable for uh, a thriving business uh, climate in the 1920s. So the idea was that the uh, traveler would start in New York or Los Angeles and they would, it was called a, the plane train service, and they would fly during the day, they would ride the train at night over a two-day journey. So the traveler was constantly in motion and uh, they partnered with two different railroads in establishing transcontinental air transport. The Pennsylvania Railroad between New York and Columbus, Ohio, and the Santa Fe Railroad between uh, Waynoka, Oklahoma, and Clovis, New Mexico. And the rest of the trip segment was uh, in the air. And they were long hours in the air, basically uh, d dawn to dusk. They had 15-minute uh, refueling stops at various points in this western segment. They flew from Clovis to Albuquerque, to Winslow, Arizona, to Kingman, Arizona, and finally on into Los Angeles on the westbound leg. Now, ultimately, they wanted to complete the Beacon Line, which is the history that we're recording here, and then they would not need the train service at night. They'd be able to fly uh, through the night and uh, ultimately carry the mail coast to coast in 36 hours, let's say, 30 to 36 hours. Yeah. So that was their goal, and uh, to establish their viability as a new airline, then this plane and train service was vital. So, as I say, Charles Lindbergh was the technical advisor for the airline. He helped uh, standardize the design of the terminals at each of the uh, western cities. Uh, many of the airports were being constructed new at that time and Lindbergh uh, also selected the Ford Trimotor as the best aircraft, the strongest, safest, and uh, most reliable aircraft for this passenger service. <coughs> now the airline TAT uh, established a uh, design for their aircraft to carry 10 passengers and the air airplanes had radio. They had a crew of three, uh, a steward and of course two pilots. So it was a luxury service, and some of our exhibits show a little bit more about the level of that uh, first-class service that existed in 1929. They were not able to have all of the beacon sites in place when they began service in July 1929, and so that led to some problems later on coming into the winter and the following year. But uh, the routes were established, the partnerships with the two railroads were created, and the idea was that they would touch down at uh, sunset 
and either be directly adjacent to the railroad tracks or there would be a special uh, air car uh, bus type vehicle to take the passengers over to the railroad depot and send them on their way westbound or eastbound as the case may be. Here we have a illustration of the Albuquerque to uh, basically the Arizona state line, the Albuquerque to Gallup segment. And uh, we also have the, the TAT original schedule which lists down uh, in one direction the east to west and up reading up the west to east schedule. TAT stands for Transcontinental Air Transport and this is the airline that was inaugurated in July of 1929. The railroad arrangements were in place, the, uh, the meal service uh, and the mail service, everything was coordinated for this uh, initial uh, launch of the air, uh, airline venture. Charles Lindbergh flew one of the first airplanes on inaugural day from Los Angeles to Winslow, Arizona. And I believe Amelia Earhart, who was also a spokesperson for the new airline, was uh, on one of the westbound flights coming out of uh, Columbus, Ohio. The tickets were $346 for the entire flight, which was a significant amount of money in 1929. As I say, they had established the service. They had uh, designed the route, laid out the beacon sites uh, in the areas where they intended to fly uh, at night later on, including across New Mexico. There was actually a line of beacons being established by government contractors and also some sites for the airline in uh, mid-1929. But for a variety of reasons, they had problems completing the route, uh, the construction, especially in this western leg, which went from Albuquerque to the uh, Acomita, Grants, Milan area, and then went up to Gallup along the, the highway, Route 66, in the Santa Fe Railroad. In fact, in the 20s, pilots had very little in the way of charts or navigational equipment, and they followed the railroad wherever they could. They referred to this as the Iron Compass. The whole system was designed basically to run itself. There were not enough people uh, on the payroll for the government or for the airline certainly to, to man these beacons which were located every 10 miles ultimately along the entire route. And within about 10 years, uh, at the beginning of World War II, I believe there were something like 1,500 to 1,800 beacons operating across the United States. Not only the transcontinental routes, but more and more north-south routes, uh, connector routes. <clears throat> the beacon system was quite a development. What's the significance of the arrow on, on from seeing it from the air? You see this arrow pointing in a certain direction at these beacon sites. At each beacon site, uh, the tower is centered on a concrete arrow and this was a system <clears throat> developed on the first northern transcontinental airway, uh, New York, Chicago to San Francisco. And it was carried over in the new design uh, here in 1929 for the TAT route, the Midcontinent Airway. The arrows are basically a day indicator that tells the pilot where to look for the next beacon 10 miles away. So you'll notice as you look at the aerial photographs and uh, satellite images that the existing concrete arrows uh, that are still visible generally are not a dead straight uh, line. They're generally going to kick you off to the side by 10 or 20 degrees, in some cases 30 degrees or more. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that the beacons uh, the facility, the generator plant, the tower and all, uh, first of all needed to be reasonably accessible by road even if it was just a two-track forest road. Secondly, uh, they needed to be uh, reasonably uh, straight, in a reasonably straight line for pilots at an, at an altitude of a thousand feet. From a thousand feet up, everything was actually focused on the pilot's eye. Uh, the beacon lights themselves were angled just very slightly upward. 
so that a pilot in would see two or three of these beacons at night in the distance. At a time. But uh, sighting the towers in the actual rotating beacons, as I say, was partly access to the facility for the technicians to service it, keep it operating, and uh, partly based on the terrain. This building, for example, came from Bonita Canyon in the Zunis, and uh, the beacon itself was about 800 feet up on the rim of San Rafael Mesa. And the next beacon uh, to the west of us was Oso Ridge on the Continental Divide, and the beacon tower actually stood right beside the Forest Fire, uh, Forest Service Lookout. So, so about every 10 miles you see one of these beacons? That's exactly right. Okay. And in the old days, uh, the early days, they were often, the concrete arrows were often painted. At one time, the color scheme was, I believe, black and yellow in some parts of the country, and then uh, red and white. Uh, ultimately, they uh, settled on international orange, and uh, you'll still find some traces of yellow or orange paint. In some other areas, such as down on the uh, southern border of New Mexico, uh, the arrows that are located at uh, the intermediate airfields uh, have a red grout overlay. So rather than paint, they, were act they actually added that red color uh, because the soil, uh, the, uh, the ground, was so similar to the concrete color. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a short break now and we'll be back soon.